Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's, I'm very pleased to see so many of you here tonight. My name is Carl Brown. I teach in the history department here at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. And um, let's see, this wouldn't be, it wouldn't be right to start this talk any other way than in, in the world of words of Ronald Reagan, we're bombing Russia in five minutes. Mm. Sorry, Cold War joke, you had to be there. I got it, I got it. Thank you, thank you, Jeff. Um, I just have a couple of uh, things I'd like to say before we get started tonight. Um, first off, this talk has been sponsored by the Tommy Thompson Center. Um, and uh, just a few words on them. Um, as you know, the Thompson Center was established to follow in the footsteps of Governor Tommy Thompson, who worked with colleagues on both sides of the aisle to advance the public good. The Thompson Center seeks to carry on Governor Thompson's legacy by informing and inspiring current and future uh, public leaders, fostering leadership skills, and promoting effective public leadership. They work to further these goals by offering public events, such as the one tonight, uh, funding research and scholarships, and various other uh, projects. All of their events are always free and open to the public. For academics in the audience, they, are, uh, they uh, provide funding for both research and for talks like this. The deadline for that is May 9th, sorry, May 19th, so you'll want to get planning on those if you haven't started already. Um, I owe some thanks to a number of people who have helped me put together this event. Most notably, uh, Nick, Eric, and the other guys working in the, uh, the techn technological side of it. Let's give them a hand right now. Yeah, uh -huh. um, let's see, Morgan and Lucas in event planning. They're the ones who are responsible for the buffet. Some of us were at earlier tonight as well. Um, Colin Bolchin, put your hand up for a second. Thank you. Colin's the president of File for Theta, and he has been instrumental in helping put this together. Give him a big round of applause. Moreover, those of you who are here for extra credit for a class that your prof told you to sign in, he's got the sign-in sheet, so you'll have to talk with him after the lecture. You have to stay for the whole thing, and then he'll help you get extra credit that way. Um, let's see. So with all that out of the way, let me introduce Dr. Jeffrey Engel, um, who is a noteworthy uh, figure. I could talk for hours about him, but I'm going to try and keep this short. Um, he's the founding director of the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University. At Southern Methodist University. Um, he's a graduate of uh, first Cornell and then a master's and PhD from University of Wisconsin Madison. He's also studied, um, um, held a postdoc at Yale and also studied at Oxford. So uh, the author of, sorry, the author editor of more than a dozen books. Um, he's currently working on um, two projects in particular. Those are um, the 1992 Race for the White House That Defined Our Lives, titled Thinking About Tomorrow, and also a text called Seeking Monsters to Destroy, How Americans Go to War. Uh, this, of course, is mundane to our uh, conversation tonight uh, about the new Cold War between the U.S. and, the, and Russia. What went wrong? Here to answer that question, ladies and gentlemen, is Dr. Jeffrey Engel. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction, and it's wonderful to be here. It's a little loud. Um, I want to give a whole bunch of thanks at the start. Uh, I want to thank, of course, Professor Carl Brown. This, we've had wonderful conversations and emails, and that continued over coffee today, and I, I think I'm quite sure it's going to continue after this. Thank you for your hospitality, and to the entire history department here. Uh, I have had some wonderful conversations. This has been a true, true pleasure. It's, I mentioned to some of the folks that uh, you can really immediately tell when a department actually functions and likes each other, which is rare. Uh, and so this one does. So it's, it's wonderful to see. My thanks also to uh, Phi Alpha, Alpha Theta and to the Tommy Tompkins Center as well. I actually went to UW-Madison, as Carl mentioned, and uh, was there when Governor Thompson was the governor. So nice trip down memory lane there, right there for me. But you didn't come to hear my trip down memory lane. You came here to think about and to ponder whether or not we're in a new Cold War with Russia. By the way, you can make the same argument about China. We'll get to that in a little bit. Whether or not the United States has entered a new phase that sounds a lot like the old phase, which of course begs a variety of questions. And I think since this is a Phi Alpha Theta event, we really should start by thinking about why the hell do we study history in the first place? Well, there's a couple of reasons, I think. Um, probably more than I'm going to name, but a couple I think that are really useful for me. I mean, there are some people who will tell you, to be honest, my wife's also a historian, she will tell you the following, that the past is a, a foreign country. You can go and visit, but you'll never get what it smells like. You'll never get what it tastes like. You can sort of have a good sense, maybe, of what the past is like, but it's something you're never going to experience. I don't believe that. Don't tell her I said that, but I don't believe that. 
Well, I think there's actually two greater reasons to study history, aside from the fact that you want to learn about a different culture. The first is, and this is perhaps the single most important, the first is because it's really neat. I mean, it is the most interesting story you can possibly imagine. How do I know this? Because think about the last couple of years in American politics. If you had written the story of the last couple of years in American politics and submitted it as a work of fiction, it would have gotten rejected for being too crazy. <laughs> so consequently, that tells us that studying the present and studying the past is a really good, exciting story in and of itself. But there's another reason, which I think is probably what drew you here tonight, which is, of course, the idea that by studying the past, by thinking about comparisons for what people suffered through, what people thought through, what people decided good and bad in the past, that can hopefully inform and help us understand the present and make better predictions about the future. Now, you have all heard that phrase a thousand times. The wonderful phrase, those who do not study history are destined to repeat it. Let me assure you that's actually wrong because those of us who study history are also destined to repeat it, but we're a little less surprised. And that can be useful especially when we think about something like what's going on with the Cold War, perhaps renewing itself. Now, of course, to ask whether we're in a new Cold War, we have to ask, well, what was the old Cold War? Now, there's a variety of ways to understand the Cold War. You can see it as an ideological conflict between the forces of free markets and democracy against the forces of communism. You can see it as a geopolitical struggle. You can see it, frankly, as I like to, which is really a fight for who's going to control Germany and Central Europe because that does seem to be where war has been focused in the 20th century. So whoever controls that industrial base might have a leg up for reconstructing Europe and working in the 21st century. So you can see it as all kinds of different competitions. And of course, where you look as with your lens of attention is going to tell you a different story about what the Cold War was. For example, one of the things that's really popular to study in Cold War studies right now and for those students who are thinking about a thesis or thinking about graduate school, this is free advice. The really hip thing to study right now is the Cold War in the Southern Hemisphere. Because if you stop and think about it, most of the actual violence and fighting of the Cold War, most of the war part, if you will, took place in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, I would argue, yes, that's true, but it was actually decided in the Northern Hemisphere. Which is to say, if you look at the Southern Hemisphere and the Cold War, you would see it as maybe a story of imperialism, a story of competition for resources. You could use a world systems analysis to try to understand whether or not the different regions of the world were going to effectively you know, allow themselves to be exploited or to be exploiters. But I think ultimately, as I said, the Cold War is really fundamentally a story about power, about which system was going to define the future starting not just in 1945, but actually thinking about it at the very end, I think is a good way to understand what the Cold War was, which is to say I'm going to encourage you to remember a really unusual and fascinating time, it's been fascinating my entire life to be honest, the end of the 1980s and the early 1990s. Because a series of events occurred then that I argue shape the way that we're living in today as a consequence of their Cold War context. And here's the really fun part about this story. Uh, it's pretty random. Now, when I say pretty random, that could either make you feel very comfortable or really, really scared. It makes me feel really, really scared. Because, uh, and I'm an optimist, but I'm gonna tell you about a whole bunch of different moments when the Cold War could have gone terribly wrong, perhaps should have gone terribly wrong, and we were lucky. We were lucky at the end of the Cold War because Something very unusual happened in global history. The Soviet Empire, and yes, I think that's the best way to understand the Soviet Union. The Soviet Empire, because as I mentioned, I think it's a story about power. The Soviet Empire collapsed. And not so many bad things happened. Perhaps yet. If, insert your own ellipse here. Which is to say, that's really weird in global history. Throughout history, I challenge you to find when a major global empire has collapsed without an ensuing series of great power wars. I can't find one. And in fact, the end of the Cold War adds another element of this that's really quite, quite terrifying, that if it's true that the world has never seen an empire collapse without an ensuing great power wars, 
It's also true that we never ran that experiment before, as humans, with 20,000 nuclear weapons in the mix. That is to say, the stakes of the Cold War are really something that we need to keep in mind and actually will help us think about whether or not we're in a new Cold War, because the stakes of the Cold War, time and time and time again, were nothing less than the potential annihilation of all life on the planet. That is such a big sentence. I think we have to pause to wrap our minds around it because it's not hyperbole. This is a series of conflicts, potentially, that would end all life, but it didn't. So come with me now, back to that heady time, 1989 to 1991, when the Cold War ended, when the Soviet Union did what? Well, that's a really good question. Did the Soviet Union surrender? Did the Soviet Union give up? Was the Soviet Union defeated? We'll get to that question in a moment. But at the time that we need to focus on, the beginning of the 19, uh, excuse me, the mid-1980s going forward, there was a great deal of enthusiasm and excitement among American intellectuals, among American policymakers, over this idea that was crystallized by somebody who you've probably heard of and probably read, crystallized by a young man named Francis Fukuyama. A uh, young PhD in political science was actually working for the State Department because even then you couldn't get jobs in political science. And he came up with a really interesting title. Not, note I didn't say theory. Really interesting title. The title that he came up with for his research project, which of course was a study of Hegelian dialectics, and who isn't fascinated by that, was the end of history. We have reached the end of history, he argued. There's a lesson here, by the way, because this is now, by far, his work, when it came out first as an article and then subsequently as a book, the best-selling book on Hegelian dialectics ever. Most of the people who bought it didn't read it because they thought they understood it from the title. That is to say, people thought Francis Fukuyama was saying, I look around the world and I see democracies triumphant. I see the role of freedom, if you will, rolling throughout Europe, rolling throughout China. Remember, this is the period of Tiananmen Square in China, which, while it does not end necessarily well for the forces of democracy, does suggest that there is a force of democracy in Asia and in China. And Francis Fukuyama said, that's it, we're done. All of human history, he argued, all of human history has essentially, from a political scientist's perspective, been a struggle to determine what system of government we're going to use. And we've tried a lot. We've tried kings, we've tried communism, we tried fascism, we tried pharaohs, we tried religious cults, we've tried a whole bunch of deities, we tried a whole bunch of things. In fact, this is my term, not his. I like to think of Fukuyama's argument essentially as saying there's a big NCAA basketball bracket of government types, and they're knocking each other off. And it turns out that the 20th century we were down to the final three. No, it wasn't the final four, so the analogy breaks down. But the final three, which of course was democracy, communism, and fascism. World War II knocks fascism out. By the way, ask yourself if fascism is on the rise today. That gives you a sense of how permanent Fukuyama's theory is, but we're not there yet. World War II knocks fascism out, which means the Cold War is the finals. The Cold War is the struggle between the last two systems. And whoever wins, Fukuyama argues, actually argued, past tense, whoever won was going to determine the fate of humanity going forward. There would be no more systems. Therefore, there would be no more history, or rather, the purpose of history itself had been revealed. Now, I have to tell you, this is actually not really an optimistic argument. It sounds good. It sounds really good for Americans. It sounds really, really good for those on their side, their allies. Why? Because Fukuyama is saying, and this is how the New York Times put it in their review, Everything's great because we won. Because we won. Democracy triumphed. Now, Fukuyama actually argued, and these are the pages nobody actually ever read, so I'll give you the quick synopsis. Uh, he actually argued that that meant that humanity was never going to fulfill its destiny. Because Hegel teaches us, he said, that you cannot be a full man, yes, he said man, you cannot be a full man, a man in full, get all of your spirit, energy, and focus unless there is crisis. And what greater crisis could there be than determining how to live one's life? 
And if your life has already been determined structurally and that is always going to be in a capitalist democratic sense, nobody in the future will ever experience that struggle again. So the actual title of his book isn't the end of history. It's actually the end of history and the last man. He argues in the book, the last really dangerous, treacherous, uncertain period of anxiety in, America, in global history that makes us who we are as humans has already passed. I can assure you, Professor Fukuyama, who teaches at Stanford now, does not believe that anymore because a lot has happened since to suggest there's still some anxiety. There's still some questions going forward. But I want to turn back to this question of we won, this idea of we won, because that is actually the way that most Americans understand the Cold War. I'm going to make an assumption that most of the people in this room are American, so I'm going to say that most of you probably understand this as we won the Cold War. In fact, I'm going to go a step further and say if I walk down the street or if I were to poll randomly in this room, who won the Cold War and why? Well, nowadays most people wouldn't give an answer at all. But if they did, they would probably say something along the lines of, well, Ronald Reagan won the Cold War. And how did Reagan win the Cold War? You might ask, the second question, by outspending the Soviets. Here's the narrative that Americans believed at the time, and Americans continue to believe, I think, going forward, that the Cold War had been going on, obviously, since the late 1940s. It had become a permanent fixture of the international system. That is to say, people talked about how to perhaps improve superpower relations, but nobody thought that we were going to change the basic dynamic of two sides competing for global power and global hegemony. And consequently, uh, Ronald Reagan did something really radical when he took office in 1981. And by the way, it's, it's interesting to remember that Ronald Reagan really was a radical. Um, uh, both parties feared Reagan because he was way too conservative for most Republicans and not a Democrat for most Democrats. So he was a radical thinker. And one of the things that he argued was that we should change the system. We should change the fundamental dynamic which has been built in premise entirely on fear which is to say, how has the Cold War not actually produced a hot war, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, at least in a place that perhaps matters, like Europe, how has it not produced a hot war since 1945 when the history of the world suggests, from the American perspective, that every 20 years or so, at least in the 20th century, the world goes to war and we have to solve the problem. I mean, I think that's the way American history is typically taught to students in our country. There's a little bit of truth to it. If you think about the 20th century, we were fine living on our own. That's not actually true, but this is the way American history is taught. We were fine living on our own. We had our own continent. Everything was great. South America, we explored whenever we wanted to, but that's a different story. But then World War I happened, and we realized we couldn't stay in our own isolated bubble anymore. So Americans, again, this is what's taught in history, Americans did that great sacrifice and brave thing they went over and they put Europe back in order. And then they did what they always did, or always should have done, or always wanted to do, which was say, hey, let's go back to our isolation thing. By the way, none of this story is true. But this is the national narrative that Americans have, in particular, again, at the end of the Cold War, and I think to some extent today. Well, World War II happens in this narrative. Again, we have to go over and save Europe. That's our thing. But this time we're gonna stay and get things right. And how do we know that we've gotten things right by 1989, or at least by the 1980s when Reagan comes in? Because there hasn't been another war. And Reagan says American presence in the world, therefore, is a promotion of stability, but it's a promotion of stability built through fear, which is to say what's really kept war from happening, he argues, is the fact that those 20,000 nuclear weapons are out there and are really scary. Because if you're basically premising your entire defense, not on defense, but rather on the idea that you can annihilate the other person too, that's not a really comfortable Christian thought from Reagan's perspective. Now, he winds up taking this idea in a whole bunch of different variety of directions. Um, the most famous, of course, is the Strategic Defense Initiative 
aka Star Wars, which was an idea that sounds nice and actually sounds a little bit more plausible today than it was back then. The idea that you could somehow create a system, a shield, a cover, mostly in space, mostly using lasers, because Star Wars, mostly using lasers to shoot down incoming missiles and therefore protect the American people. And Reagan actually, and I think he was actually quite honest about this, said, after we develop this, we're gonna give it to everyone. We're gonna give the technology away. We're gonna give it to the Soviets so that everyone can live without the fear of nuclear annihilation. And that sounds nice. And I gotta tell you, Reagan's an interesting cat. Uh, there are two presidents I do not understand at all. And in fact, the more I study them, the less I understand them. The first is Franklin Roosevelt. Apparently, that's a, that's a popular view of Franklin Roosevelt. Because Franklin Roosevelt, of course, was an enigma in and of himself. That is to say, he was more a chameleon than anything else. He had such a wonderful personality that he could make everyone that he talked to think that he was agreeing with them, whether he was actually saying anything or not. Which means finding out what he actually thought is really, really hard, because you can't trust anything he said. That's president number one. President number two, for me, is Ronald Reagan. I don't want to get into a fight about Ronald Reagan. I am less impressed by Ronald Reagan than others. Because I think a lot of the ideas that Reagan offered were wonderfully simplistic. We should get rid of nuclear weapons. We should create a, a, a shield over us. We should, as he put it, to explain the Cold War, transcend it. He said communism is going to end up on the ash heap of history. And my theory of the Cold War, he said, is we win, they lose. By the way, I, I teach a strategy course. Uh, and I tell my students every year, that's not a strategy. That's an aspiration. But it's a good line. Now, uh, I come from Texas, not originally, you can tell from the accent, but are you from Texas? So I'm glad we can speak this language. So I presume you're armed. Um, so I come from Texas, and we have a senator you may have heard of called Ted Cruz. Uh, and Ted Cruz loves this line, we win, they lose. I think he uses it about three times a day. Uh, he says, my theory of lunch is we win, they lose. My theory of driving home, we win, they lose. Again, it's an aspiration. It's not a strategy, because a strategy gives you some sense of how you're going to get there and what you expect at the end. And Reagan's thought for how you're gonna get there, as I mentioned, was we're going to transcend communism by building a shield. We're going to outspend the Soviets, because he thought you know, communism fundamentally doesn't work, and therefore we can essentially take a system that's already stressed and stress it more, until it collapses. And third, we can call out its moral failings. That's say one of the problems that Reagan had with the idea that the Cold War was a permanent fixture of global society is that it gave an air of legitimacy to what the communists were doing. One of the things the communists were doing that really bothered Ronald Reagan was denying their citizens access to God. He's actually a very spiritual man, though he never went to church. Again, enigma. And Reagan thought that that was more a moral ab abomination. So his argument was, if we build the shield, if we build a lot of weapons, we can stress them, and they will collapse. Now, I go through this discussion of Reagan for a variety of reasons. First, to tell you again that he was a very interesting thinker and that it's not clear to me that he ever actually thought through what would happen next. That is to say, the problem with we win, they lose is what does the loser do? And we all know there's such a phrase as a good loser and a bad loser. Uh, you just have to watch it one basketball game and you'll appreciate that. And that some people, some societies, take losing better than others. But I just told you, there's never been a society in human history that was an empire that collapsed and took it so well that there wasn't a global war after. Excuse me, a great power war after. I don't think Reagan ever thought of this. The other thing that's really interesting about Reagan, well, there's a lot of interesting things, but one of the really interesting things uh, is that he lived his life backwards in some ways. A lot of people do this, but Reagan's 
living his life backwards, which is to say he made his decisions about where to go forward based upon his own history, his experience informed where he was going to go. One of the difficulties was Reagan was that oftentimes the reality that he called upon as memories was actually from movies he was in. I'll give you two great examples. Uh, the first is, uh, you all know Reagan was a great speaker. I mean, give the guy credit. He could give a speech. He was a, I mean, he is exactly what a president should look like, right? He's got the square jaw. He's always wearing a nice suit. You know, he, he gives a good talk. And he started explaining, this is about 1983, he started explaining to reporters once that Americans have a spirit that transcends normal countries. We are exceptional. We are God's divine instrument. How do we know this? Because Americans sacrifice for each other. Americans care for each other. He said, we all know that story, that great story of that bomber in World War II flying over the Pacific. The B-17 gets hit. They're going down. The pilot's holding on just long enough for the rest of the crew to bail out. And the co-pilot says, I'm stuck. I can't get out. Save yourself. I'll fly the plane. Save yourself. And of course, the pilot looks at him and says, no, Johnny, we'll ride this ride together. And they crashed. It's a good story. Uh, a couple of days after he gave this speech, one of the reporters in the White House press room kind of picked their head up and said, wait a minute. There's only two guys left in the plane, right? And they both died, right? So how do we know this happened? Well, it was a very nice movie that Reagan was in. <laughs> Similarly, uh, he was in a movie in which aliens attacked. Why are you laughing? That's a great premise for like every other movie. <laughs> it wasn't a zombie movie, it was an alien movie. Aliens attacked, and the ways that Americans defended themselves was by building a laser-based satellite shield in space to shoot down the enemy coming in before it could attack us. And I would argue this is actually one of the primary reasons that Reagan came up with the idea for SDI. We also know from the evidence that he talked to basically no engineer or scientist before <laughs> announcing this. Now, you could read this as great leadership. Seriously, because Reagan said, my plan is to outspend the Soviets, I need new ways to get my government, though I'm a conservative, to spend money. I'm gonna come up with a fascinating research program, which is so long range, I don't, nobody expects we're gonna get results for decades, that's great, because we're gonna funnel money into business and funny, funnel money into universities for decades. And we're gonna get a lot of basic science and a lot of good engineering out of it. In fact, you could argue that the internet, in some ways, is born from this spending. That was not Reagan's thought, but you could make that argument. Uh, I'm reminded at one point I was discussing this when my own university president was in the, in the room, uh, giving the same basic point. And one other person in the room raised their hand and said, I'm sorry, if, if nobody thought it was going to work, who knew anything about science, why did it get spent a dime? Why did it go forward at all? And I said, well, Mr. President, he's a good guy. I knew he would enjoy this. Mr. President, let's suppose that you're the president of a research university, just suppose, uh, and the government comes to you and says, I'm gonna give you a billion dollars to study something that you as a scientist know is not going to work. What is your response? And he gave the best response ever. He said, uh, make it two. <laughs> so you can see why people were enthusiastic about these plans. But all of this that I'm mentioning to you has revolved around American thinking and the way Americans perceived they controlled and acted within the world. We save the world, we struggle, we sacrifice, we spend, and we save the world again. You can forget everything I just told you if you really want to understand why the Cold War ended. Because it turns out that Reagan was right, but not for any reason that he anticipated. It turns out the Soviet system was already failing. We now have all of their records. Well, most of their records. 
the records, you can't get to the records now, but a lot of Americans, and this is important to the story, a lot of American universities, actually Stanford took the lead in this, went over at the end of the Cold War and bought everything, bought every archive. I was actually there in 1994 as a poor, starving graduate student. No, as an undergraduate, as a poor, starving undergraduate student, and literally watched the Stanford people come in and say, we'll take those 12 boxes without even asking what was in those 12 boxes, because that was the way that they were going to get the documents out of the Soviet Union. When a regime collapses, it doesn't necessarily care about holding on to the secrets of the previous regime. I mean, think about you know, the national fetish that we have in our country with classified information and documents. Well, if the US government didn't exist anymore, who would be embarrassed by those secrets getting out? Maybe one or two people, maybe a CIA agent would be a little you know, red-faced, probably not. So my point is that we really know, because we have all the documents, what was going on in Soviet thinking and Soviet circles throughout this, their entire regime, in particular in the 1970s. Because by the mid-1970s, every Soviet policymaker understood on a national level that their system was not working, that the system was broken. They weren't producing any kind of spiritual patriotism for their people, and they weren't producing for their people. That is to say, the standard of living and the life expectancy for Soviet citizens was going down. And in fact, the Soviet Union had been essentially living on its oil exports throughout most of the decade. And you know from studying the 1970s that in addition to bad hair and disco, there also was a series of oil shocks, which also means that sometimes you can make a lot of money on oil. The Soviet Union had been living off that pool of oil for a long time, and then the bottom dropped out of the market. Consequently, it revealed, if you will, as they say, you only find out who's naked when the tide goes out. The Soviet Union was naked, and every policymaker knew this. And we know this not only from the documents, but also from their jokes. Soviet jokes are great. Uh, I would argue, in fact, that in, as a general principle, jokes within totalitarian regimes are really insightful. Because let's face it, if you talk openly about your problems, you're going to get thrown in the gulag. But if you can say, well, I was just joking, and it's funny, then you might be able to get away with it. So here's a joke that was extremely popular in the Soviet Union in the late 1970s. Late 1970s. Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev, for those of you who are not up on your Soviet leadership, the leadership of the 1940s, 1950s, and 1960s and 70s, okay? A body by these three leaders, Stalin, Khrushchev, and Brezhnev, are all riding in a train car together. And the train stops. Now, being good Soviet leaders, they realize that their mission is to make sure that we get the train moving again. And they begin discussing the various and sundry ways they might do this. Stalin, being Stalin, went first, and he said, comrades, I know exactly what to do. I have experience with this sort of thing. We just go to the local village, round up all the villagers, shoot half of them, and the other half will be really incentivized to get the train car moving and get us out of here. And they say, well, there, that is a, there is a logic to that. They discuss it for a while. Uh, Khrushchev says, no, 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 comrades, I have a much better idea. All we need to do is denounce the previous train driver. I thought you would laugh at least at that. <laughs> that's kind of an inside Soviet joke, because that's what Khrushchev did when he took over power. He denounced everything Stalin had done. Why? Because Stalin was dead and couldn't get him. <laughs> but here's the kicker of the story. Brezhnev, leader of the 1970s. Brezhnev says, no, 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 comrades, it's so much easier than that. All we have to do is pull down the window shades, rock back and forth, and pretend we're still moving. <laughs> that is the Soviet economy by the 1970s. And every policymaker knows it. But a series of policymakers come to office, Brezhnev included, and then a man named Andropov, and then a man named Chernyanko, who themselves sort of physically embodied the decrepitude of the Soviet system. They were all old men with lots of health problems who lasted very short time in office, really symbolizing the state in some ways. And they all recognized that the Soviet Union was in trouble. 
and there was no second sentence. Suddenly something happened that happens very rarely in history. History meets the moment, history meets the person. Uh, an individual comes to power in Soviet Union in 1985 named Mikhail Gorbachev. Now, if I were to rank my most important people of the 20th century, we could get into a fight over who's number two, who's number three, who's number four, but we know Gorbachev is in the top five because of what he did, as I'm about to say. He did that really unusual thing for a policymaker. He not only recognized the problem, he said, let's do something about it. Now, you don't have to be a communist state to appreciate how rare that is for a politician to actually try to solve the problem that they're identified. I think that's rampant in every political system, certainly our own. But Gorbachev said, we're going to change things. And I have to stress here, Gorbachev is a true believer in communism. Gorbachev is a true Soviet patriot. He wants to save the Soviet Union and make sure it prospers into the 21st century. So everything he does, you know the Soviet Union's about to disappear on his watch about five years from now. He's, that's not his goal. His goal is to save it. And he says, we're going to do three things. We're going to have perestroika, political reform. We're actually going to get a little bit more democracy into our system. That is to say, if we can't openly debate and discuss what the best solution to problems are, we won't get anywhere. If people are afraid to talk, we need more democracy with a small d. Second thing is we need um, glasnost, forgive my horrible pronunciation, which essentially translates to openness. That is to say, it's, if we can't actually talk about real things, how can we have real conversations and find real problems? The problem, Gorbachev said, was the existence of fake news. Now, he didn't use that phrase, but you all understand the concept of fake news, and Gorbachev did too. He said, we are lying to each other constantly. In fact, lying has become so endemic to the Soviet system that you cannot believe any document or any number or any output on paper. My favorite example is, um, while he was general secretary, he wanted to know how much cotton was being produced in the country. General secretaries have these desires. He wanted to know how much cotton, and the only way to find out how much cotton was being produced in the country was to get the Air Force to use their spy planes to fly over Kazakhstan and other regions of the Soviet Union where cotton was produced to see how much was growing because they knew that about half of it was going to the black market. Or maybe more, we don't know. I'm the, I'm the leader of the country and I can't get this information. By the way, the better example of this, the more tragic example is of course what happens at Chernobyl. If you've not had the opportunity to see the HBO series on Chernobyl, I highly recommend it. It's gripping and horrible and wonderfully acted. And one of the themes that comes through that they really nailed in this miniseries is that nobody told the truth about what problems were. Gorbachev, as leader of the Soviet Union, could not get anyone to give him a reliable answer on what was going on at Chernobyl for weeks and then months. First rule of crisis solving is find out what's going on. You can't get a real problem if you don't know what the real solution, if you don't know what the real problem is. Gorbachev also said a third thing, which is largely forgotten to history, but I think really perhaps the most important. He said, we're going to build a common European home. That is to say, we too want to transcend this Cold War thing. Not the way Reagan does. Reagan says, we're going to wind up in the ash heap of history. My job is to save the Soviet Union. We're going to build bridges to Western Europe. We're going to say, without the Americans and their idea that they need to be involved in European affairs every 20 years, without the Americans, Europe would function much better. Now, he has no history to support this. But he says, listen, look at Western Europe. They're social democrats. They like free health care. We like free health care. You know who doesn't like free health care? The Americans. <laughs> we have more in common with the rest of Europe than the Americans do. They should be building our bonds. And by the way, there's something very interesting going on at this exact moment that lends credence to what Gorbachev is arguing because this is the exact moment that the European Union is coming into being. So when Gorbachev says, we need to fuse Europe together and form a common European home and transcend barriers, 
he's not making this stuff up. He's saying, look, those seven countries are already doing it. We need to be able to join them. By the way, this idea scares the bejesus out of American policymakers. Why? Because, again, remember their theory of history. Their theory of history was, so long as Americans are present in Europe, wars do not break out. And by the way, that, there hadn't been one since they had been there. Cold War, yes, but not a hot war. And if the Europeans and the Soviets ever got together, they might say to the Americans, thank you for your service, you can go home now. And that would ensure that a few years later we're going to have to go fight a war again, again, in the American ideal. So Gorbachev wants his common European home. Gorbachev wants openness. Gorbachev wants more democracy. And here I have to give Ronald Reagan a great deal of credit. Ronald Reagan, who I would argue in 1983 actually produced a moment in global history more dangerous than the Cuban Missile Crisis. Why? Because Gorbachev, excuse me, because Reagan said things like we're going to leave communism on the ash heap of history. He said, we win, they lose. He said, we're going to purge the world of communism through a crusade of fire. They are an evil empire and they must be expunged from the earth. And a funny thing happened on the way to victory. Um, the Soviet leadership actually believed his words. And there are, in 1983, I can go into detail in the Q&A if you like, a series of nuclear crises that bring the world closer to nuclear annihilation, I would argue, than even the Cuban Missile Crisis. And at several moments, they are averted. In fact, here's one of these moments where we see an individual pop up with randomness. One of the nuclear crises was actually caused when a Soviet uh, radar station, observation station, up near the Arctic Circle, because the missiles from the United States are going to come over the Arctic Circle, that's the shortest route, when a Soviet station suddenly, for no apparent reason, at 4 o'clock in the morning, realizes that they are being about to be bombarded by hundreds of missiles. Now, there's no reason to expect this, other than the fact that Reagan had been talking about a crusade of fire. There's nothing particularly going on in the international system, other than Reagan saying, we're going to win the Cold War. He does what he's supposed to do, this colonel. He calls the Kremlin says, uh, sir, sorry to wake you, we're being attacked. Make a long story short, uh, he then does something really important, which I encourage all of you to do as a life lesson. In fact, you probably already know what he did because you've used computers too. What do you do when your computer's not working? You turn it off and you turn it on again. He said, hey, you know what? This is just too weird. Let's reboot the system. And when he reboots the system, it becomes very clear that this was a computer malfunction, and it turns out that was actually just a very large flock of geese. <laughs> but here's the important thing about the story. The people in the Kremlin were about this close to pushing the button that would launch the retaliatory strike, because that's the way the Cold War was designed to work. In normal circumstances throughout the Cold War, Soviet leaders, having no particular reason to think we're going to be attacked on a Tuesday, would not have reacted that way. They would have thought about it a bit more. But Reagan had created an environment where they actually believed that the end was near. Because they believed his words. Isn't that scary to think of people actually believe a president's words? And Reagan, to give him credit, learns from these experiences, and some others as well learns from the experiences that maybe my words do matter. Because it never really, genuinely never occurs to him that the Soviets were taking him literally. And therefore, when another Soviet leader arises, a new Soviet leader arises, he never got the chance to meet the first, any Soviet leader in his first term in office. Why? As he put it, they keep dying on me, which is true. He did a remarkable thing when someone else extended their hand in potential partnership, Mikhail Gorbachev, I haven't explained why yet, but I will in a moment. When someone else extended their hand, he reached his hand back. Say what you will about Reagan, as you can tell already, I don't have a lot of great things to say about Reagan. I give him tremendous credit for learning in office 
and for being willing to change everything he believed when the opportunity arose. He reached across the aisle and met Gorbachev. And Gorbachev was trying to save the Soviet Union. How? Yes, through democracy, openness, and a common European home, but also by doing things like restructuring the economy, not spending money on armaments. If we can have peace instead of conflict, that will allow us to rechannel those energies, those industries, and those supplies into a better communist state. And to be honest, it works out pretty well uh, until it doesn't. Which is to say, the problem that Gorbachev faced that he could never solve was that the transition he was talking about was really hard. I mean, really hard. No one had ever tried it before. Transforming an entire empire from one ideological system to another. Which meant that before things started to get better, they got worse. And I mean really worse. Soviet life expectancy plummets in the 1990s to a rate lower than before the Bolshevik Revolution. Just stop and think about that. It's as if all the science and medicine of the 20th century had never happened. The number of calories that the average Soviet citizen gets in the 1990s, when the Soviet Union doesn't exist, so Russians at that point, and other places that used to be republics, also is below the level of before the Bolshevik Revolution. Now think about that for a minute. If one of the reasons that people overthrew the Romanovs was because they were hungry, and here we are at the end of the 20th century giving our people fewer calories, it doesn't take a great political scientist to realize they're probably not happy campers. Technical term. Which is why, as the 1980s turned into the 1990s, as Eastern Europeans begin to take advantage of the openness and perestroika that Gorbachev offered and found their own way to communism, which in some cases meant eliminating communism, so the same thing happened in the Soviet Union and centrifugal forces ripped apart the system, leaving the Soviet Union on the ash heap of history and replacing it with a Russian empire. Russian, its vassals, if you will. And yet the economy kept getting worse and worse, and the politics getting worse and worse. The man who came in after Gorbachev, a man named Boris Yeltsin, um, just to give you a sense of how he was a true Democrat, small d, uh, when he disagreed with the parliament, he was the president, he rolled the tanks up and shot the parliament. That's your democratic leader in Russia. I want to tell you a personal anecdote about this, actually. I was there in 1994. Um, I look nothing like I look today. Um, I was hoping that would get a bigger laugh. Uh, which is to say, when I was there in 1994, as an undergraduate, there was no food in the city, so I lost about 30 pounds. I was living in a place where I didn't have a mattress, I had roaches on top of a mattress. When I got off the plane to get home, my mother literally burst out into tears because I was completely covered with roach bites. In case you're wondering, and I'm sure you're concerned about my health, uh, I'm actually allergic to roaches now. And what's really interesting about that is when I went and did a standard allergy test, because you know everybody in Texas have, has allergies, the doctor said, we got this weird result. You're allergic to roaches, but the only people we ever see allergic to roaches are underprivileged inner city kids. Because you've got to spend a lot of time with roaches to become allergic to roaches. And I said, oh, I've got a story for you. Uh, I also uh, wasn't bathing that often because there wasn't hot water, or any water, really. Uh, I wasn't shaving because I'm you know, 20 years old and I thought that'd be cool. Uh, and I was wearing the same shirt every day for two weeks because I couldn't get, a, get any clothes to wear. washed. So you've got a picture of what I look like, okay? And I wanted to call home. Now, those in the room who are not familiar with the 20th century as a personal experience, phones used to not move. If you wanted to make a phone call, you had to go to where the phone was. And in, here's the other thing. Certain phone lines did not go to every place you wanted to talk to. So if I wanted to call home to tell my mother about the roaches, which I didn't, because she would have cried then, 
Lesson for your students when you're traveling abroad, don't tell the truth. When I wanted to call home, I had to go to the hotel that had the CNN and the NBC headquarters because they had a phone that reached the outside with my calling card. Calling card. Uh, now, this was a heavily armed area because the Soviet system had collapsed. There was a lot of discussion over who was going to own the resources of the Soviet Union afterwards. And therefore, a lot of nefarious means were used to acquire property, shall we say. One of the properties was actually that hotel. A uh, few weeks after I was there, there was a series of gun battles between the different owners of the hotel and their factions. It gives you a sense of the stability of the region at the time. So you got to picture this. There's guys with Kalashnikovs. There's people who are trying to get in to see the Americans, because that's where the money is. There's all these people whose lives have been upturned who are trying in some small way to figure out some future, and they can't get into the hotel. But I walk right up to the front door, and when the guy with the Kalishnikov gets in front of me and says in Russian, what are you doing, punk? I use the magic phrase. You know what the magic phrase is? I'm sorry, what? At which point he says, oh, American, go ahead. <laughs> this personal experience, I think, explains everything that happened subsequently within us russian relations. That is, imagine the shame and embarrassment of those former Soviet leaders who were now Russian aspiring business people who couldn't get into the hotel, and they let this punk American in. This was not going to end well. I thought, and it didn't, because the economy got so bad that Yeltsin was forced to retire. He also was drinking a lot. And Yeltsin, and this may shock you, Yeltsin, like some other leaders around the world, maybe even in our own country, had really gotten rich in office. Now, ask yourself, how does that happen? The answer is usually not one that the person wants to reveal. The current leader of Russia, as you know, Vladimir Putin, is estimated to be the richest person in the world. And he has no public assets except for his yearly salary. How does that happen? Let's just say through nefarious means. And Yeltsin, knowing that he was going to be put on trial for these nefarious means, cuts a deal with the next guy, a guy named Vladimir Putin. I will put you in charge if you promise not to prosecute me. Say what you will about Vladimir Putin, he's a man of his word. He did not prosecute Yeltsin. When he died, he prosecuted their kids, but that's a different story. Uh, and he told Russians a very important story. And this is where I'll end. He told Russians that you didn't lose the Cold War. The Americans didn't win the Cold War. You reached out for that common European home. You were the ones who de-escalated tensions. You were the ones who initiated nuclear cutbacks. You were the ones who pulled troops out of Europe. You were the ones who allowed democracy to come in. You were the ones who got from NATO and from the American Secretary of State, James Baker, on February 6th of 1990 in Moscow, a promise that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. By the way, NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, the American-led defense com compact. You got a promise that NATO wouldn't expand one inch to the east. And Yeltsin, excuse me, um, Putin, was able to, for the last de generation, say, everything you were promised, the Americans lied about. The economy only got good when we reasserted price controls under a strong leader, i.e. me. You only started feeling good about yourselves once you started listening to true Russian values. Got to get rid of all those Western influences, homosexuality in particular. He really doesn't like that one. And lastly, uh, the world only respects you when you're strong. How do we know this? Because when we were weak, 
the Americans broke their promise and moved NATO not just a few inches to the east, but all the way up to our border. In fact, he then essentially drew the line in the sand at a place you've probably heard of recently called Ukraine. Used to be part of the Soviet Union. Used to be a nuclear weapons state as well, but they gave them up at the end of the Cold War with the promise that other countries would protect their security. How'd that work out? And consequently, uh, Putin draws a line. And here's what's really important. Here's the thing I want you to think about when we think about a new Cold War. If it was about ideology, if it was about theory of government, well, in theory, the Russians now have the same theory of government that the Americans do. Putin was elected, snicker, snicker. Putin was elected. There's a capitalist economy there, again, snicker, snicker. Much in the same way, by the way, if you look at China and say, well, China's still technically a communist state. Anybody here been to China? It's the most capitalist place you've ever been in your life. What the stories we tell ourselves are not necessarily the reality of our situation. So we are strong, he says. We are prosperous now. We have the respect of the world. Why? Because we are no longer giving in and we are no longer allowing the West to encroach upon itself or put our values into us. You didn't lose the Cold War, he says. You were the good guys and you played fair and were then, technical term here, screwed. So what's the lesson you should draw, Russian people? Don't trust them again. You can't trust anything the Americans said because they promised prosperity. They promised peace. They promised NATO would not expand and none of those things happened. One lesson to be drawn here is, uh, again, by comparing the Soviet Union to China. That is to say, the Soviet Union no longer exists. The People's Republic of China does. Both were faced in the late 1980s and early 1990s with democracy movements, fueled by a desire to integrate with the West, fueled by a desire for political liberalization and economic liberalization. One state reached out their hands to the West and said, we will be your friend. The other state rolled tanks into the square and into cities and put all the protesters in jail, or worse. You know which state still exists? The one with the tanks. So I think when we think about whether there's a new Cold War, we have to recognize that the lesson that the leaders of our countries draw from the past are really critical to understanding the decisions we're gonna make in the future. Now, it may not be that Joe Biden is a Cold Warrior. It may not be that Donald Trump was a Cold Warrior because the Cold War was something that we thought we won, so it becomes less important. You never see a post-mortem on a victory. That's just not the way commissions are set up. But the lesson that the Russians took was power is what matters. And by the way, I would argue, one lesson that policymakers are taking today, and you can decide for yourself whether this is good or bad, is that, and this is really tough for somebody who's French to say, but one lesson that European policymakers have drawn is that, you know what? For 70 years, the Americans have been saying they are indispensable to our security, and that really made us angry. How about that for a non-profane term? That really bothered us. And you know what? They're right. I guess it's true that we actually do need this NATO thing. I guess it's true we actually do need American leadership. And the only question that we have, therefore, is if one state, the Russians, believe power is going to be the future of the 21st century, Europeans believe power is going to be the future of the 20th century, and they would like to align with the United States, as they had been, what lesson do American leaders draw? Now, I gotta tell you, I can't answer that question for you. Because something weird happened in 2016 called Bernie Sanders. Not the guy you were thinking of, maybe. Because I ask you, if you think about President Trump and you know his views on NATO, he's not a fan. You know his views on international free trade, he's not a fan. 
You know, his views on democracy, I would argue, he's not a fan. And you compare them to Bernie Sanders, their foreign policies look exactly alike. Both of them say the fundamental flaw of American foreign policy from 1945 on is that we were over there. Whether over there was Europe, whether over there was the Middle East, or whether over there was Vietnam, whenever we went somewhere else, it turned out bad for us. Which is to say, if I can draw you a figure who is popular enough to become president in 2016, and another figure on the complete opposite side of the political spectrum, who is popular enough to become the runner-up, if you will, in the Democratic nomination process twice, who argues we need to reel back, that suggests to me that Americans might as a whole think that's true, no matter what their policymakers had told them and no matter how they had read history. I right, thank you for your time. Oh, that's great. Uh, again, Jeff, thanks so much. That was uh, informative and interesting. We got some time for uh, Q&A, so if you would like to ask a question of the good Dr. Engel, you can step up to that mic uh, right there. I'll also be circulating with the mic if you just want to put your hand up. I'll walk over to you. Um, Jeff, I'll start off. Um, that's my prerogative as the guy who set this up. Um, the, the, something you touched on towards the end of your remarks, and, I want to, and, and, and I'd like it at, to speak a bit more on, is how Europe fits into this scenario. I mean, if you had told me five years ago that Finland was going to join NATO, mm -hmm. and that other Europeans would be happy about German making more military things, um, I would have said you're crazy. But those are both absolutely, you know, what's going on now. So I mean, I guess my, my, instead of a comment, I'll have a question. What, um, what do you think Europe is going to do as the conflict in Ukraine drags on? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I think, just to reinforce your point, if you had asked us what do we think Europe is going to do a year ago, a year and a month, when the Russians were thinking about invading, and the Americans kept saying, they're going to invade, they're going to invade, and every European capital said, no, they're not. What the Europeans have done, which is to ramp up their arms production and throw resources in a way that they never thought possible into a military conflict, lest you get drawn in yourself. Nobody would have believed you. So I think that Europeans are largely going to follow the American lead in the short term, and bizarrely enough, in the long term. The middle term is what worries me. The long term, I think, is that Europeans have realized that it's better to hitch your wagon to the Americans. Even if they're a somewhat declining power, they're still the ones that you'd rather be with. We don't have enough strength to do it alone, by the way. Not least because the European Union is fraying. Have you noticed England's no longer in it? And in the long term, so I think the long term they know that they need the United States. In the short term, they know they need the United States because they don't have the armaments to supply Ukraine the way, like we do. The medium term is, how does the war in Ukraine end? I have no answer for that question. Because, uh, in a sense, the Ukrainians have done too well. Let's say, remember, every war, at the end of the day, is negotiated. Sometimes it's negotiated more violently than others. Sometimes you have unconditional surrender, though that's actually pretty rare in history. Most wars are actually decided at the peace talks based upon events on the battlefield. We know that the Russians want all of Ukraine, and we know that they do not necessarily have democratic impulses guiding their foreign policy. But the Ukrainians, if you had told them you know, a year ago that they were going to have a fundamental policy argument over do we win versus do we survive? They would have been thrilled with that question. Because the debate in Ukrainian circles at the beginning of the war was A, are we going to live? And B, how much land are we going to lose? Now, Vladimir Zelensky and other Ukrainian leaders, and remember they're democratically elected too, have essentially unified around a position that the war will not end until we get all of our land back, including Crimea, which we had already given up for all intents and purposes. So when the war currently going on drags on for year two, year three, year four, year five, that's, I think, a place where we can see European and American tensions 
split because the Europeans, frankly, have done a really good job of integrating a lot of refugees, done a really good job of remodeling their economies, but they can only do that for so long. Whereas the United States is removed and has its own problems. So short term, okay, long term, okay, medium term, worry. Is that working? Yep, I think so. So my question is this. So obviously understanding that Vladimir Putin is someone who came from, you know, a very Soviet background. He was a KGB agent. He, it was a very formative time in his life. Um, part of his goal, I think it's fair to say, would have been, you know, taking Ukraine seemed like a fairly easy target. I don't think he thought that NATO would ever want to be involved in that. And it would be quick and easy, and it would be a good way to, you know, flex that power that you've talked so much about. That didn't work. It wasn't a blitzkrieg attack on Poland, for lack of you know a better comparison, perhaps. So, what in his mind do you think, you know, understanding the lessons of his predecessors, how does this end for him? I mean, I don't think he wants nuclear war. Mm -hmm. I don't think he wants to lose because that's an insult to his power that he's worked to build since the early early two thousands. That's a great question. Um, let me say a couple words about Putin as a person. Um, it is notable, as you just did, that whenever someone describes Vladimir Putin, they point out that he was a former KGB agent. Um, and the implication of that is that he doesn't just play three-dimensional chess, he plays nine-dimensional chess. He's really sharp. Uh, there are three million Americans who have security clearances of the same level as Vladimir Putin did in the Soviet Union. No offense to the people in the intelligence community, but do you really think all three million are capable of nine degree chess? No. See the young airman who just got in trouble a couple weeks ago, or last week. Uh, Putin was actually a terrible KGB agent. We know this for a fact because his job was to recruit foreign spies. And if you're really good at that job, you get sent to Paris, London, Sydney, Silicon Valley. Uh, he got sent to, to Dresden. He got sent into the closest ally the Soviets had, which was already, by the way, a, a remarkable information state. All of which is to say, I, I wouldn't put too much credit for Putin because of his background, but rather because of his effectiveness as a leader. But I think his effectiveness as a leader has been undermined somewhat, obviously, by, as you pointed out, by the performance of Russian troops on the battlefield, which has not been good. By the way, you could argue this is exactly a very Soviet experience, because why has Putin's forces done so much more poorly than anybody anticipated, including him? Most likely because he got bad information from below. I mean, when he says, I'm spending 100 rubles on tanks, and it turns out only 30 rubles actually makes it into tanks. But his tank commanders who are pocketing the 70, million, the 70 rubles tell him there are 100 million rubles worth of tanks. Excuse me for screwing up the numbers there. You get the point. Um, bad information led him to think he was going to do better. I would argue, though, that Putin actually has the ability, almost a unique ability, to end the war victoriously whenever he wants because the Russia is now a totalitarian information state. There, you cannot criticize the war without being, you cannot discuss the war effectively without being thrown in jail. There's no open internet. Uh, they're throwing Western journalists into prison, obviously. All of which is to say, if Vladimir Putin tells everybody on Russian media, the message of the day is, we won. We got what we wanted. We stopped NATO from expanding. They're never going to try that again. We won. We're drawing the line here. He gets to declare victory and go home whenever he wants. So I think that's the, the solution for Putin, is to recognize that uh, whenever he tires of this, he doesn't just end the war, he wins the war. Sir. Um, now that like a lot of the documents from like the Cold War era have been declassified, we can kind of see that a pretty solid chunk of the uh, information that the CIA got from Russia during the Reagan presidency was um, like mostly misinformation. So, do you think that like uh, like the since the Reagan presidency and the information on Russia was some of it was uh, misinformed, 
Do you think if it wasn't like that, uh, the fall of the Soviet Union would have come a little more quickly or been a little more peaceful? Well, first of all, I would say the fall of the Soviet Union was actually remarkably peaceful. Um, the only place we actually see violence on the streets break out is in Romania. Everywhere else, the collapse was incredibly peaceful to the point where I think we were incredibly lucky. That's a different lecture. Uh, in terms of the information, uh, I don't want to make it seem like I'm dumping on the intelligence community as a general rule. I think they do a great job, really, but it's hard. It's really hard. And it's hard not just because it's hard to get information, it's hard to understand when the information does not agree with how you think the world works. So let me give you an example, my favorite example actually, from the Bush administration, the first Bush administration, the one that came in directly after Ronald Reagan. The Berlin Wall fell in early November of 1989, completely by surprise. Again, different lecture. Just I, let me tell you, it was a surprise, it was fluky, it was lucky, it shouldn't have gone that well, and it should never have happened. It's one of those things where somebody made a mistake and the snowball started rolling, and next thing you know, the world has changed. American policymakers using intelligence reports realized that the, there, there was pressure growing within East Germany for transit and pressure growing for, for uh, emigration in particular. And so the Bush administration, I love this, the Bush administration at the NSC level, National Security Council, people who work in the White House on national security, in late October passed around a memo, talk about action, passed around a memo that said effectively, we think something's gonna happen in Eastern Europe, or excuse me, East Germany. We should think about what form of committee structure we should set up to establish how we're going to discuss and analyze how we're going to create solutions to this problem. That's bureaucratic speak for a couple years at most. And then it happens the next week. So I think, the intelligence community, like everyone else, was shocked by what happened, by the speed of what should happened, because it just shouldn't have happened that fast, except by accident. Sir. Uh, so you discuss that um, the, the, the lesson that Russian leadership took from uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War is that you know, power determines everything. And we see that Putin talks about the Soviet Union as like, the, ep the epitome of Russian power, right? He certainly thinks that the former Soviet Union, at least, is Russia's natural sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, like modern Russia is a capitalist state. And so I'm kind of wondering, it, what is the role in Russian leadership, uh, what role does the Russian leadership ascribe to communism for like the future of Russia? That's a great question. Um, First rule of Russia, maybe the first rule of anywhere, but certainly of Russia, is if you're looking for internal ideological consistency, you're, you're not going to find it. Um, this is why, on the Western side, you could make a whole career out of trying to figure out what the Soviets were saying, because they were constantly trying to figure out what they meant. Say what you will about American policymakers, they typically have a good sense of how their system actually works, for good and for ill. So more important than communism from Putin's perspective is nationalism. So his fundamental argument, I think, and this is a very powerful one throughout many countries in the world, is that you, Russian citizen, are a cog in a bigger machine that has divine purpose and global meaning. So your particular sacrifice, if you don't do well in the market or if you don't do well on the battlefield, is in service, if you will, of greater mother Russia. Which of course, we have to remember, is the exact rhetoric that was used in World War II to rally the Russian people to defeat the Germans. Soviets in World War II, by and large, you can find some, some examples, but by and large, 
were not inspired to save the Soviet Union, and they certainly were not inspired to save communism. They were inspired to protect their homeland. And I think that's what Putin's going to draw on going forward. So he is less bothered by the fact that there is inconsistencies in the fact that he celebrates an economic system that he doesn't practice because he's actually drawing a broader lesson, which is the real goal of the Soviet Union was to provide a safe space and empire for the Russian people. And that's what he's promising. So uh, I think at the end, talking about Sanders and Trump, you really showed a great example of the political horseshoe and how they very much have similar ideas regarding almost a similar end to a US interventionalism and then the America first mentality. Do you think such policy is possible in our current globalized society? And if it is, do you think it would actually work or only cause more problems globally? Okay, um, let, me, that's a, let me break that down. <laughs> Uh, do I think it's possible? That is to say, do I think it's possible that a person could become president and we have an imperial presidency and have for a full century and a half and the president is primarily in charge of determining US foreign policy? So do I think it's possible that we could have an American president get into office with an American first agenda? Yes. I, I think I've got history on my side on that one. Um, and. Uh, NATO is one of the things I really focus on in my own work, and I get, I'm willing to bet every dollar in my pocket, actually we don't carry cash anymore, so every Venmo I have, <laughs> that uh, NATO would not have survived another four years of Donald Trump. So is it possible that there could be political will in this country to remove the United States from the foundational military alliance that it created 75 years ago? Yes. Now the second part of the question, what would happen? Uh, you know, I actually believe that there is more than a germ of truth to the observation that when Americans are engaged in the international system, they're not perfect, we make mistakes. The invasion of Iraq in 2003 was literally the worst strategic decision in US history and by the way, obvious from the get-go. But our hearts are in the right place. And I think if Americans retreat from the international system fully, you're going to see a reversion of the 1920s and 1930s where strategic interests begin to form economic blocks, begin to form rivalries, and I don't like where that goes. So uh, this is difficult because I'm not a big fan of foreign wars either. I'm not suggesting we need to be interventionist. But I do think that the world does need a leader. And frankly, I am more comfortable living in an American-led world than in a Chinese-led world or in a Russian-led world. By the way, it's important to note, Chinese have no interest in leading the world. Only the Americans and the British before them have this crazy idea that our system should be universal. Chinese are perfectly happy saying, let's do what's good for China. And why would we ask anything else? I mean, the idea of a China first narrative in China is laughable because there is nothing else. You know, the, when Donald Trump stands up and says America first, he has to then explain what that means. You don't need that conversation if you're in the Chinese leadership. So uh, I would be very worried for the future of my children if the United States fully ejected itself from the international system. All right, so when looking at the Russian economy, the crash of the ruble has recovered to, quite frankly, a five-year comparable. Uh, do you think that other countries have become more complacent with the Russian invasion of Ukraine? In the last year, have they become more complacent economically or, or in terms of their Complacent how? I would say in terms of uh, you know, supporting Russians' economy um, and importing or exporting from them. Uh, no, as a matter of fact. Um, I, I think the Russians have gotten better at getting around Western sanctions. By the way, 
they're not stupid, give them credit for being able to do that. Uh, and I think currency is not the place I would look to for the answer to this. I would actually look to the international bond markets and international investment. And international investment, I hate to sound like Thomas Friedman here, but international investment in Russia is a pittance of what it was just a few years ago, which wasn't very impressive then. Remember, Russia's economy is about the size of Vermont's, if I'm not mistaken. Um, not to diss on Vermont, but uh, the numbers do matter here. So I would look at the bond markets and investments and realize that the Russians are not going to get the long-term investments and cannot generate the long-term productivity for themselves to do much more than be a nuclear-armed Vermont. But notice I said nuclear armed. Sir. Yeah, so um, you mentioned earlier that like Britain is obviously out of the EU. Some of that is started to fray. Um, we see in various European countries, Italy in particular at the moment, but rising throughout different European countries, these like nationalist strains, these, these strains of thought that they are removing themselves from these kinds of organizations. How do you feel that impacts the future of NATO and these alliances? Oh, that's a great question, because um, I thought you were going to end at a different place. Uh, I am really, really worried about the rise of nationalism in our country, too, um, because it usually leads to some form of ethnic purity, which, as a Jew, I'm not a big fan of. So the rise of nationalism in Poland and in Hungary, and in um, which Professor Brown knows far better than I, uh, that worries me as a citizen of the world. However, comma, I think NATO is in a really strong position right now because even fascists in Italy or fascists in Hungary don't want to be under the thumb of the Russians again. So in pure security terms, I think that NATO is actually remarkably strong. Now I have to stress when I talk about NATO, please remember, um, what Winston Churchill used to say, that the only thing worse than allies was having no allies. Which is to say, allies suck. Because they, don't, they do things in their interest and not yours. And NATO has quite literally been in crisis since it was formed. It's the, the very nature of its existence. But I think that crisis is actually less now than it was perhaps in any period for the last half century. As a military organization, as a military alliance, as a defensive organization, um, I'm actually quite bullish on NATO right now, even with the rise of nationalism on both sides of the Atlantic. So I, sorry, I'm just checking this. So. So there was the Syrian conflict with Putin intervening in the war. And I'm just wondering, do you think that played a role in the whole Ukraine? Like they actually serve as an impetus for Putin invading Ukraine, that his intervention in Syria? So if I could read into your question a little bit, there is a, a discussion within American political circles, more so I think than policymaking circles, about whether or not the American response in places like Crimea, in places like Syria, um, and elsewhere, Afghanistan, if the fact that Americans seem to be demonstrating that they would not fulfill their commitments encouraged Putin somehow to be aggressive, uh, I'm not actually impressed by that for the same reason that I'm not impressed by the notion that we won the Cold War. I think we give ourselves too much credit for saying that we can dictate how other countries are going to view the world. So I think Putin was intent upon Ukraine no matter what. Now, the really interesting counterfactual to ask, to ask yourself, really interesting, is not whether or not Putin drew the lesson that America wouldn't lead a fight back, lead, lead a defensive force, but rather if Donald Trump had won the 2020 election, and Donald Trump is on record as saying things that the Kremlin likes to hear, like Ukraine is not a state and not a real country, et cetera. 
would the United States have led this mission? I don't think there's any way it would have. So the question for me is not what Russians drew as a lesson from the previous years. It's what might have happened and might still happen on the side of American leadership. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's great. Everybody help me. Thank you, thank you all. I look forward to your papers tomorrow. <laughs>